In this tutorial, I will show you how to create a custom and very flexible honeycomb pattern and to use it as a base mat for your animations. A few weeks ago, I saw a post on Reddit with a user asking how you can create something like this. And it got me intrigued because this is a really, really nice animation. I will provide a link to this Dribbble account and the designer's profile, then you should really check it out because his work is exceptional. My solution was to use a multi-mat rig and heavily utilizing essential graphics panel. It's not exactly as um, this animation, but it's pretty, pretty close to it. And I learned quite a few things which I could share with you. Before I do any kind of advanced animations, I want to think about a method that would let me actually create it in the first place. Since the um, inspiration for this piece was made with hexagons, we have to start with the hexagons themselves. Now, I don't want to create lots of elements in After Effects by hand. That's why I figure out I have to use a lot of expressions to automate this process as much as possible. So if you think about hexagon, it has a circle in the middle as a center itself. And we want to know what is the distance from the center to its nearest wall and to these points as well. Like these points are pretty easy to find out because based on radius. But this distance, we have to use trigonometry. And basically this is called apothem. And we have to use this formula to find out what is the distance from center of the hexagon to its side. And once we know that, we can easily offset every single hexagon to its neighbor and so on. Now, next step will be to create a honeycomb pattern like this with the shapes going left and right. And when I was thinking how to do this on um, a bigger scale, I decided not to create full HD composition and create lots and lots of shapes, but to use a smaller composition and then have basically it duplicated over and over in another comp. And this way, After Effects have to only do calculations on one composition or the like heavy lifting with the expressions. And this gets fed into all of them at once. So in theory, that should save quite a lot of computational power for us and the render faster. In my approach, I decided to create a rig that will let me select hexagons in a circular fashion. So kind of rings per se. And if I combine this with, you know, um, an array, circular array of text layers and mat them on top of each other, I should end up with very similar a result as the inspiration piece. So how do we do it? I will make sure to provide the project file um, I created for this tutorial and all the necessary links in description, plus a link to my blog with explanations for every single expressions I'm using, because there'll be quite a few. So if you get lost, you'll be able to play around with the uh, project file itself. I want to use half of the height and 540 as well. That will be plenty just basically a smallish square then in full HD composition. Then I just need to create hexagon like this. Okay, polystar, I don't need the stroke and six, call it hex one. And uh, naming of the layers will be important to help automate this process as much as possible. I need to create a controller, which is a null object with bunch of sliders. Okay, we have three sliders. The main one is the radius itself. And I need to link the hexagon radius to well, the radius itself. Okay. And that will let us change the size of all the hexagons in the composition very easily. And apothem, this is basically the distance from the center to the nearest side. And to calculate this, I just need to press U, grab it, link it to the hex radius. 
Okay, and this is pretty straightforward. I'm referencing the radius of the hexagon itself, multiplying it by math squared value of three divided by two. And basically this, this formula, it's what I referenced at the beginning on this website, which is exactly this. Now to automate this whole setup, we'll have to create a bunch of rules and a bunch of complex expressions, which will make sense as we go along. Okay, so if we look at the expression itself, um, I'm referencing two sources, which they are being fed down the, the whole kind of expression stack. I'm referencing control layer, and then I'm grabbing two of the sliders, the, uh, the border and the apothem itself. Then I'm grabbing the initial position. The initial position is the layer with an index plus one. So if this layer's index is four, this is five, and so on and so on. And if everything is stacked as it is, so if I just keep duplicating the last layer in the kind of stack itself, everything will be offset to the right. And in basically with looking at this logic, the position, this one, X and Y, is being driven by the layer before it, and so on and so on and so on, until we get to our first master layer, okay? Because so this is the layer that controls everything. But I want it to be zeroed out completely. Now, next step is, it's just create new X position, which is basically X, the initial one of this layer, plus hypothen times two, because the hex apothem is the distance between center to the nearest side. So to get the whole distance, we just have to double it, okay? And the last thing is to add a border because I want to be able to control this nicely with a slider like so. So we have our rows. Now I have to create a row that will automatically offset itself to the right or the left, like this. So if I keep duplicating them, that's how the whole pattern will look like left, right, left, right, and so on, and so on. The way to do this is with expression, and this is where the stuff will get a little bit complex, but I will try to do my best to explain it. So what we need to do is actually rename the very first layer as row one, grab everything as it is, duplicate it, bring it to the top of the stack, and I'm going to change the color of it to something like whatever, green, doesn't really matter. It only helps me to tell the differences between the rows themselves. So if I grab row two, I can move it manually like so. And if I just change the color of them, the green, that's perfect. This is how it looks. But I don't want to keep duplicating stuff like this, move it there and then grab it and just move stuff manually because it's not very precise. So how can we semi-automate this step? So the expression to help us automate this process looks like this. It's a bit complex, but I will try to do my best to explain it. So as before, we're just defining some sources, control layer, which is this one over there with all our, uh, all our sliders. Then I'm grabbing the name of this layer, the row two, and using split command. And basically I'm using a space bar over there, this is important, to split the values in the name of this layer into individual, basically, values themselves. What's happening is I'm basically separating the name into individual chunks. Then I'm creating two new variables, name one, name two. And basically we can reference those individual chunks by index value. The first one, a row, is index zero, which is this. Second one is index one, and so on and so on. This is a row and this is the number of the layer, or well, the number in the name itself, actually. Then I'm basically subtracting minus one because I want to find out a name of the, the leader of this row itself. In this case, row one. Okay, so basically I'm using the name of the layer to find out who's actually leading this stack, which is the one above it, right, row one. And how do we do this? Is basically we combining 
those two variables like this with a spacebar, and that gives us a new name, which is basically row one in this case. Okay, and then moving on. I'm defining a bunch of variables, X and Y, of the leader, which is like lead row, basically position values. Then I'm bringing in all the effects itself, uh, all the sliders added to control layer, radius, border, and hypothen. I'm dividing border by two because otherwise it will be offset too much and basically later on it will clash like this. It won't be equal. You have to place it directly in between this gap, okay? Between the row before this one, which we're trying to affect now, okay? So those ones, all the variables done. Now, the last part, this is where the, a little bit more complex stuff happens. So I need to create position variables. So positive X and negative X. What I mean by this is if the name of the layer, like row two, it's even, which is positive, uh, it should be pushed to right because I'm just basically adding the distances and adding the border and so on. If it's negative, it should be pushed to the other side, which is basically the, the minuses, that's what they're doing. Now, the last thing is to just create a um, variable Y. So I'm adding the radius of the layer and I'm just basically offsetting it downwards by 1.5 times from this Y position of the, of the lead row itself. The last thing to do is to run an if statement in a variable itself. And based on different results, it will automatically feed different values into the final uh, array itself. So this if statement is actually checking if the reminder of this value, which is name two, which is actually a result of the split command. And because this is index one is actually the number in the name, it's divisible by two. And if it's equal to zero, then something happens. It should be positive. If it's higher than zero, that means the name itself has an odd number. It should result in negative value. As in, it should use negative variable as a value in this variable, basically. So one thing feeds into another, feeds into another, and then we do the check. To further understand this, you can do some reading on Stack Overflow. And this is basically the reminder of dividing number by two and checking if it's equal to zero. But now we have to see if this actually works. I have to add this expression to the row two layer itself only. And there you go. It's perfectly positioned just outside the comp size. So now I'm going to select this row. Just remember these two this is row zero, which is the main, main leader per se. This is the first row that actually does this left, right switch. So I'm going to select it, duplicate it, move it to the top. And I'm going to change the color of it to something like orange. So now to fill up this whole composition with perfectly spaced out shape layers, I just have to select row two all the way to the end of hexagon layers duplicate, drag it up, duplicate, drag it up, and so on, like this. There you go. And because we built in all these controllers over here, we can easily modify the size and spacing like so. We are at this stage now, we have individual rows, we have the whole kind of hexagon grid, and later on we will turn it into basically full on big composition but I need to figure out a way how to automatically select individual hexagons in a circular fashion. And there is a way to do it. What we want to do is basically use distance from the very, very top of the composition, or in this case, a control layer, and use the length expression. So for example, if this shape is within a specified distance, it will be either visible or not. And this can be visualized with a circle. This is just as a guide. So this step is optional, but it helps me visualize what I'm actually doing. So this is a guide. Don't need the fill. 
but I need the stroke and I need the path size. I need to create two more sliders on our control layer, the node itself. And I'm actually going to solve this guide itself. Change the position to zero and zero. And then I'm going to link the size and the stroke to respective sliders. So now if I change this and make it like this, this will act very, very nicely. Okay, and then there's one more step I need to do and it's basically add offset path. And I want to link the offset path to the stroke itself and divide it by two. So this way, the stroke is exactly on the outside part of the, the path size itself. This will help us visualize uh, all the selection process in a second. So the expression that helps us turn the layer on and off based on the distance, it looks like this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select all the shape layers, press option T and I'm going to add the expression to opacity. So this expression is referencing uh, the control layer the layer it's being applied to, and then it's simply just grabbing a bunch of variables. In the first part, it's grabbing the position of the control layer itself, the, uh, the null, and the position of the layer it's being applied to. And then we're simply referencing uh, the circle radius and then the stroke radius. The, the circle radius is basically, I want to know the distance from the point of the null itself to the position of the hexagon itself and the the stroke radius is like extra like a, a buffer zone of sorts that helps us tweak the selection if we need it the main part of the expression is literally this the length between controller and then the position the two positions the the hexagon layer it's the whole thing is applied to and the controller itself and then i'm specifying extra variable which is the max which basically is the, the length, this part, and then simply I'm just adding the, the, the stroke radius to it. And the final part of this expression is simply running an if statement. So this if statement is basically, it does two checks. The first check is if the circle radius is equal to or higher than um, the length itself, so if the distance matches and it's higher, and at the same time, it cannot exceed the maximum allowed um, distance, right? This part. So then it does this double and statement. Then it, uh, it checks if it's equal to or lower than the max. So we just basically checking if the, the distance is in between these two numbers. Both of those checks are correct. Then the layer should be visible 100%. Anything else, it's invisible. So now I can make this really, really small and really like fine tune selection. As you can see, I can have like a singular line of hexagons only. Oh, I keep expanding my selection to have more um, hexagons showing up basically. If I select only the last, as you can see, the very, very last layers in every single row, and I simply keep pressing Command D and duplicating it like so a couple of times. Based on the current size of 25 pixels and uh, 4 pixels gap, this should reach towards the end, as you can see. And because of all the expressions and the positions we've written before, everything is, gets nicely automated and offset. And if I select the bottom bit like this, the last two rows, and do Command D, and then just bring it up like this, like so. One more time, and one more time for the good measure. And just bring it up. There we go. I'm literally just dragging it so everything gets positioned perfectly as it should be. So now we have basically the whole canvas is covered with um, hexagons. And to check that, you can just play with the, there you go, with the radius itself. This way you can check it easily if everything is working correctly. So this was the most difficult part of the tutorial. That's why naming uh, was really important at the very beginning, but we are pretty much done with the setup. I'm going to open the 
honeycomb layer in the essential graphics panel, the circle radius and then stroke radius to the very top. This will let us select different parts of this setup outside of this layer very easily. So if I go to the honeycomb mat and then simply drag the layer we created with the essential graphics properties, we can quickly modify which part of the image is being affected. What we have to do is a few things. First, I'm going to reposition the anchor point to the top left of the layer itself. So I'm going to make three more copies. So what I just did was basically I put the anchor point in the top left corner, then rotated some of these layers around like so, like this is 180 degrees, this is 180 as well, and this is like minus 180. And I simply use the, the trick of flipping the scale. So by flipping the scale, as you can see, the layer literally flips as if it was done in a 3D space. So we can literally use this kind of origami setup to have what we need. And the next stage is to... Okay, then you just need to drop a null. Call this a controller. I'm gonna make it a guide so it doesn't show up in any of the other compositions. And simply, let me just select it like this. There you go. By holding Command or Control on Windows and moving the, the null around, I can snap the anchor point to the anchor point. And what I can do is then parent all of these layers to the controller itself and easily center everything in the middle of the main composition. So to be able to easily, so to be able to easily control which hexagons are visible, I need to link the circle radius and stroke radius to two new controllers. The reason I'm doing this is if I open this layer in essential graphics panel and try to drag this here, you get this warning. But there is a workaround for that. Basically, by creating new sliders, we can drop them into Essentials Graphics Panel. And if we link all those properties, like Stroke and the Circle Radius, we can easily control everything from one place and as well from the Essential Graphics Panel, which will be important in a minute. If I put the matte compositions into its own comp, we can duplicate this bunch of times with different values and this way we can easily create honeycomb a uh, matte rig of sorts. If we go back to the very very first composition we built with all the layers themselves and I'm just literally just going to lock the control layer to the top and this composition is the very final one with all three different layers. It allows us to very easily change the, the size of the hexagon themselves, the distance between the borders, and the whole thing updates and it's perfectly set up. And because of all the controls we built in, we can quickly change the, the values and there you go. And you have like a totally different setup very, very quickly. Now in the next tutorial, I will show you how I use this setup to animate the text to make it go in all sorts of directions and merge in the middle.